thank you for having me here, and, and it's, it's great to see such a broad range of uh, centers uh, represented here today. Um, this, is a qu this quality initiative is something that's new for Syncardia, and, and I'd really like to take a minute and thank Don, Pete, and Catherine for putting this together, because we, we've lived in the TAH world in sort of a data-free zone for a long time. Um, people kind of did their own thing. We didn't really talk about it. We didn't know what was going on. You'd hear rumors. Uh, and not only did um, Zincardia create a medical advisory board, surprisingly enough, they actually listened to them uh, and have started to do some of the things the medical advisory board uh, has recommended, including looking at data. So um, we're going to, uh, I just want to go through sort of a summary of what data are coming out and uh, what we've learned from it and what we might do in the future and, and get your thoughts. So the quality initiative has the usual handful of uh, principles behind it. It has transparency, uh, it has publication, and it has accountability. Uh, and so I'd like to go through a few of uh, the uh, transparent uh, items, notably the tears. You hear about tears, they sound terrible, they sound disastrous, they are sometimes disastrous, uh, but it has to be put into the context of the overall experience. So uh, as you've heard, um, the, these, this number is from April, so it's a little bit higher now. Uh, we're approaching 2,000 implants worldwide with over 700 years of support. So it's a fairly robust worldwide experience of using the total artificial heart. Also, there's been a robust experience of using the Freedom Driver, over 400 patients now on the Freedom Driver, uh, and uh, nearly 300 years, patient years, of Freedom Driver support. Uh, the majority of patients on the Freedom Driver have been discharged, uh, and uh, an even greater proportion have been transplanted or are still alive. But that's not really enough, because people want to know about the, the really bad events. So let's talk a little bit about tears. So what's a tear? Well, the diaphragm tears are the ones that uh, people get most excited about. That's the diaphragm. That's the multi-layered interface between the blood surface contacting uh, part of the heart and the pneumatic system, which moves the diaphragm. And it's a five-layer polymer, uh, layer upon layer upon layer. And what's been experienced is that a tear can develop on either side of that diaphragm typically on the blood contacting side, that will result in blood getting in between those laminations, okay? Now, surprisingly, in nearly 2,000 implants and over 700 years, there's only been 12 tears ever reported. Like with everything, there might be a reporting error because some patients may <coughs> die and the device never gets back and gets analyzed, et cetera, et cetera. But this is what we have. We have 12 tears with an average time to event of nearly two years. Patients that are on support for two years can develop a tear with a range of six months to many, many years after that. Of the 10 blood diaphragm tears, so this is on the blood contacting surface, there were 10, uh, eight deaths. So when this happens, it's a bad thing and patients die. I think that's a, a fair statement to make. One patient was transplanted, one patient was exchanged. There was one air diaphragm tear and one suspected tear that was not returned for analysis, but the patient was transplanted. The last reported tear was uh, two years ago with an overall failure rate now of 0.62%. So when we're talking about what we heard earlier about reliability, reproducibility, this is a pretty reliable device. We're not expecting patients to be on the device for 5, 10, 15 years. This is not an LVAD. This is not a necessarily a long-term destination therapy device. It might be DT for some people, but we have to make sure we understand that this is not a long-term solution and, in the short term, has very good reliability. But what does a diaphragm tear look like? Um, these pictures always suck. There's no way to make them better. I don't really know what to do. Um, uh, but you can see that um, <coughs> this is on the blood contacting surface. Here's a tear. Blood got in between the diaphragm and the device started behaving badly. And we'll talk about how it be behaves badly. 
And what do you see? Well, you see stroke volume loss, okay? It's not surprising. Why wouldn't you see stroke volume loss? You've got blood accumulating in the diaphragm. That ventricle, therefore, cannot expand fully. You're going to see stroke volume loss. And if it's dropping below 50, you might want to be suspicious that you've got a tear on the, on the 70 cc device. On the 50 cc device, if it's dropping below 30 consistently, and you've ruled out the other things that cause low volumes, right, like surprisingly hypovolemia, tamponade, IVC obstruction. If you rule those things out, think about this. All you got to do is think about it and understand that it's rare. I want to pause here if, to, to see if anybody wants to talk more about the diaphragm tears. Questions, comments? Has anybody experienced them in the room? It was uh, over 20 years ago, and we didn't know what it meant. But we could see the decreasing in the stroke volume over time. It, it went over uh, over a week, and it was uh, unfortunately it wasn't on the time of autopsy that we found it, and that's what made us aware that this could happen. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's, it sometimes it can be very dramatic, and sometimes it can be very subtle, depending on where it occurs. Any other comments, Greg? to when it was actually occurred or fatal? I don't have that information, and I, I suspect we never will, right? These are all sort of accumulated over a series of anecdotes uh, over the years. It's not like these are pros prospectively collected data. Um, but I, again, I, it, the failure rate of 0.62% is, is the key here. It's very rare. This is. People talk about it and get scared by it, and, and I would submit that you shouldn't be. Uh, this is something that you, you will rarely, if ever, see uh, at most centers, and only in, in, in the event that you're keeping people on long-term support. Uh, we just heard that you know the average time to transplant is two to four months. I think we're seeing that same experience in the United States, so most people aren't even getting to the six-month mark on a total artificial heart. Um, yeah. or um, proposed hemodynamic risk factors that may lead to a tear? Don't know the answer to that. Remember, these, this, this is spanning now 20, 30 years of patient data and looking at 12 patients to try to derive data from 20, 30 years ago is probably not realistic. We, we actually have, uh, you know, a number of different um, systems that are continually running. They just constantly go and turn the back room and it's for reliability purposes. And with that number, of course, we, we've never seen one actually fail internally, in-house, in any of our testing. It's, it's, it's those 12 cases that uh, obviously are confounding to us because we haven't been able to find any specific direct root cause. And a little frustrating on that front. It wasn't even in a series. It wasn't even in like a batch or anything like that. Dr. Arabia, um, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of those patients chose not to have a change out of the uh, TAH, even though the diaphragm tear was uh, identified. That, yeah, I don't, I don't know that, that answer. There was at least one. Yeah. One, yeah. And, and there were two others that we identified at post mortem. Well, mo moving on to something a little bit more mundane or cannula tears, right? So just like we have driveline yeah, issues. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing the calculation? So if, if you think about how many times the pump actually pumps, and if you say on average they wait three months for a transplant, 
and you look at all of the things, you're talking about 10 tears and over two times 10 to the 10th pumps. So, I mean, that's one of the most rare events I've ever, I mean, yeah. if you think about it, that's, there's more likely that, you know, something, ha you know, some, you get struck by lightning. So, I, I, you know, it is a very, very rare event when you really think about it. And it's even surprising that you don't even see more, right? Considering, you know, 80 times a minute, times 60, times 24, times three months. So it's really a very, very rare event in the whole scheme of things, I think. Well, and, I, and I think it goes to the concept that we heard about earlier this morning, which is the next generation is going to keep the same innards. And well, why shouldn't we keep the same innards if the, the innards are working well? There's no reason to, des to redesign it. And in some ways, that's quite shocking. I mean, right, this is 19, really 1970s technology. And we're going to hear about it from Dr. Frazier a little bit uh, later, maybe even earlier, right? That, that the best we can do came from like the 60s and 70s, which is pretty amazing. Um, you know, that's the space shuttle days. Now that we're doing for DT, so those would be there longer. And then we, we're finding, we're putting them in patients who have some of those DTs that will eventually cross over to, to bridge to transplant. So th there are some patients who are going to be on the device for quite a, a long time. So cannula tears, <clears throat> just like we have driveline issues on patients, this is the external portion of the, uh, of the device. It's subject to wear and tear. It's subject to whatever solutions the patients, families, and caregivers decide to wash the thing to, sleep on it, get it kinked, all of those things can go on, and that's a cannula tear. Um, we've seen them in uh, 49 patients now, uh, and again, over a year before these things start to break down, uh, though uh, obviously there was one patient that had a 44-day event, and, uh, uh, and then another one that was, again, many, many years out. Uh, for a total rate of 2.6% of patients experiencing a cannula, uh, a cannula tear. And, and what do these look like? Well, oh, sorry. So that's what these look like. They're, they're little cracks. They're little cracks in the plastic. Um, either uh, it, it's usually at the, at the high uh, uh, torque uh, locations, such as at the connections. Um, the first one of these I saw, I, uh, I, I got really scared because I thought it had entered the air path. Um, but when you actually pull it apart a little bit, you know, because I got called stat to wherever it was that this patient was, and all the coordinators were all huddled around, and everybody was in a bit of a high panic. And I said, all right, well, we got to look at it, so let's take the dressing down because everybody's, you know, got, it, got their hands all clamped over it, don't even look at it. <laughs> so I said, well, we got to look, so let's look. <laughs> and we look, and, and it looked just like this, which was, the outer shell had cracked, but there's an inner tube that the air path goes over, uh, goes through, and the inner tube was intact. The outer shell had cracked, and we just rescue taped it, and the patient ultimately got transplanted. Um, <coughs> yeah. I have had a few, and actually they have gone through all the way yeah. into the, the air path. <coughs> and, and you're right, you can just hold it there, and, but you can go and fix it. You can yeah. cut it and, and reconnect very easily. Yeah, um, you just done that a few times. Sure. Some big scissors to cut it. Yeah, as long as it's, <laughs> as long as it's, as long as it's uh, not the part of the tube that's connected to the heart, right? Because right, you make an external connection. You can just get a new set of tubing, and even if the thing's alarming, as long as the patient's okay, just just hold it, get a new set of tubing. Uh, and, and do a quick change out of a driver and tubing, uh, it, it, and it's okay. And with the new Quick Connect, right, it was harder in the old days before we had the connectors, right, before we got the new fancy connectors. Because in the old days, you'd be sitting there sweating with a knife trying to cut the zip tie and making sure you had the next zip tie ready to go, and you do all the stuff and get it connected, and it was a little bit more dramatic. But now it's, you know, press a couple buttons, make a couple of connections, and you've got a new, uh, you got a new drive line again. Well, are you talking about the, the tubing that goes from the driver to the connector? 
Correct. Or, or like an extra two or three years. Well, that's when, that's when you have to be yeah, a little bit more, right. yeah. Right, and there's a wire reinforcement in there. That's why you need the really big scissors. That's why you need the really big scissors. So uh, out of US and the X-Core experience, uh, you can see there are five cannula tears reported. Um, and in the Freedom Driver experience, uh, 69 cannula tears in 49 patients. Um, and the overall failure rate here is just under 2%. Uh, and again, mitigation of tears, you know, find it, rescue tape it, change out your, uh, your, um, uh, your tubing if you need to. Um, and don't be afraid to call Syncardia. Uh, they'll, they'll come help. It's okay. Um, so uh, moving on um, and trying to stay on time, uh, you heard a little bit about some of the recent publications. So uh, we're working on getting the Freedom Study uh, finalized and, and it's been submitted to ISHLT. Um, there's also been a lot of chatter about Freedom Alarms uh, and uh, what does it mean? We've actually submitted a, a uh, a, an abstract to ISHLT on freedom alarms. Uh, I can't, it's embargoed of course, but um, the, the, uh, the punchline there is it's not as bad as you think. Um, we heard a little bit about the retrospective uh, registry that's uh, uh, being put together. Uh, and also bleeding complications has been submitted to ISHLT. So hopefully on the podium this year, uh, in Montreal, we'll have uh, a nice representation of new data. Uh, because if you really look at it, recent papers have been case reports, uh, some review articles. We recently had a How I Teach It out there, uh, but not really good data. And I think for us to get to the next level, we need to have good data. And what we've seen here in terms of accountability is we've seen finally progress towards new technology, a new freedom driver, a new device. Uh, we are committed to understanding the limitations and outcomes uh, of current technology and then work with all of our centers um, to uh, make sure that we can improve outcomes. So we've had a robust, I, I, I think it, it is a really robust worldwide experience now approaching 2,000 patients. We're seeing real data coming out of the Freedom Driver which we hope to share um, uh, coming up in the next several months. There are rare serious complications of the device such as cannula and, and diaphragm tears. Uh, and, and I think the future is really bright. So I'll, I will stop there and, and allow time for conversation. <laughs>